Ready? Yep, you bet. Welcome to What the World Needs Now with hosts Tom Wisenand and Josh Monroe. We hope that you're able to leave feeling encouraged and ready for another day of changing lives in the field of education as we speak with inspirational teachers from across the nation and world about what keeps their spark lit. In this episode, we talk with Jim Hansen, a fifth grade teacher who was named the 2020 National University Teacher Award winner from New Hampshire, about how he inspires students around the globe. Without any further ado, Jim Hansen. Jim, thank you so much for being with us tonight. For our, our listeners that don't have the privilege of knowing who you are, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, where you're from, and what's your role in education? Sure. Um, my name is Jim Hansen, and um, I have the privilege of tomorrow starting my 39th year of teaching. <laughs> <laughs> so first day of school with the kids is tomorrow. So um, boy, that time went by quick, <laughs> 39 years. I teach in, I'm a teacher in Nashua, New Hampshire in the public schools. And I teach at a wonderful school called New Searles Elementary School, which is a smaller school there. And I really love teaching there. And I've been teaching in Nashua 30, since 1988. So, and before that I taught uh, six years in Brockton, Massachusetts. So when I taught seventh grade there, currently I'm a fifth grade teacher. I spent most of my time in fourth grade. I love those two ages. I did a couple of years of third grade. Whoa, but I was to loop. <laughs> and uh, seventh grade when I taught, when I started teaching in a self-contained classroom. So that was where I really learned the art of teaching <laughs> with seventh graders. <laughs> so um, yeah, and I enjoy teaching. It's, it's a, a great job, great calling. And, and um it's still a lot of fun. So <laughs> that's awesome to have you say that after so many years of teaching and not like not going and doing other things, but teaching, that's fantastic. That is, that just shows your passion. Um, how did you get into it after you've stayed in it for so long? What was the, what was the impetus to really know that this is what you wanted to do? I did not want to go into teaching. Um, I went to, I went to a, um, college prep school, boarding school for three years in high school, which I really loved. Um, and um, I, I sort of loved the way some of the teachers taught. And I thought that'd be really great to job to. I love, I'm, I'm a runner, so I ran track and cross country and I love, I had one of the greatest coaches in America there. And, and I thought, oh, someday I could teach high school or you know, be a coach at a school like this, but there's not one subject I really wanted to teach. I sort of liked everything. So it was off the market. And, and even though I went to a college prep school, no one told me what about the future. So I went to college, you had to sign up for a degree. And I chose economics, thinking that you're either a teacher or a doctor or you work in the business world. So I figured they're going to tell me about business <laughs> and how to make money <laughs> and do that type of thing. And economics wasn't my it's all theory. <laughs> I didn't know you'd go for an MBA after that. And, and you wear suits and ties all day long, which is definitely not me. And so I was an economics major for three years. And I said, this is not me. I need to find something else. And I looked to find where the interesting people were and education looked fun. I wasn't really sure about it. I was going to do some other things. And in that final year of college, I took some like psychology course in, in how human development and I was very interested. I always thought little kids were like mini adults, they're just smaller. I didn't realize their brains were wired differently. And I was interested in Piaget and Kohlberg's moral reasoning and things like that. And sort of got interested and said, hey, maybe that is, you know, something I could do. Um, and, you know, back in those days, elementary school wasn't really teaching for guys. So, you know, that was another something I sort of had to break down and say, well, I could do that. And, um, and even though my uh, college prep school, Stony Brook School in New York, did not really t teach me where to go, um, we had a model there, character before career, mm. and which I love that. And, and the whole character part is what I caught on to. Uh, it's not about making money. It's not about this. It, it's being a person of character and how can you serve um, people and use whatever talents I have. I don't think I'm a natural teacher but um i work hard at it and um the 
it, it just was a way to serve, I think, serve others in the community and use what I had and use that enthusiasm. And I sort of like kids. <laughs> They're fun. You can actually, I don't think it's hard to, to motivate adults and hard to teach adults, but with kids, you are molding people for the future. And so I thought that would be something worth doing. And I was right, I enjoy it. <laughs> so it, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And you know, you say you don't feel like you're a natural teacher, but I feel like if you've been in it for 40 years, you're natural and, and we can feel your passion coming out right now. And there, yeah, there are parts of it and there are other parts I see, you know, I'm not the best teacher at my school. I'm not the best teacher in my, my city. There are teachers, you know, that, that work with kids on different levels. They're the touchy feely ones, the ones that it's, you know, hugging the kids all the time. And, 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 you know, I, I like, I like the kids. I like challenging their minds. I like working on, on helping them become better persons, overcoming um, difficulties they have. So just, you know, being someone there to spark an interest, to motivate, to help out. Um, and I, I enjoy, and particularly, you know, as you fourth and fifth graders, I enjoy that, that age level. They've learned the basics. They haven't turned weird yet. <laughs> Although in fifth grade, they're starting to, right? <laughs> But um, so they're just sort of fun. They love learning. And, and part of the benefits of teaching is you learn things. One of my favorite parts of it, I'm learning things about history. And anytime you have a new subject, you're always learning something new, science. And, and, and it's, it's, it's just a lot of fun on a personal level to do that. It, it, it's just been a great profession. I, I, do, I, I love the fact that you're both elementary teachers. I wish there were more guys. Sometimes I'm the only male teacher in my schools that, that's a classroom teacher and the, or the first male teacher some of the students have had. And, and I don't know if you've found similar challenges and that's probably more in the past than nowadays, but um, you know, it, you're sort of doing something out of, out of the box <laughs> with, with this job. But I've had a lot of men say to me, I wish I could do something, I wish I could change my job and I'd love to do something like that, but they don't want it. They look at the pay, they look at something else, but they, you know, they say, I'd really like to do something. That sounds like a lot of fun. What, what do you think we could change about education to get more males into it? I think because particularly at elementary, it's considered a female position and a female job it, that sometimes men, you know, it's treated that way, unfortunately. Uh, it's women teachers aren't treated with the respect all the times that they should have as well as male teachers. So I, I think it's a respect thing across the board. I, I, I wish uh, society would come on even a little more and cheer on the people working in schools, the teachers and paras and, and the people that help out with kids. Um, Cause um, these, this is the most important thing we're doing is educating kids. And it, you know, if, if you want to do a job that you know, at the end of the day, you can feel proud of what you do and what you've done with your life. This is what you do. I mean, you can laugh and have fun. There's something new happening every day. There's so many, it, n nothing's ever the same. Every year is different. Every class is different. And it's sort of exciting. <laughs> and it's not dull or boring at all. I'm easily bored. I'm not bored in school. <laughs> No, Jim, I think what you're saying is absolutely spot mm -hmm. on. I think that no day is ever the same in an elementary yeah. classroom. It gets easier yeah. Yeah. as you go. And it, a lot of it is um, observing, watching, talking with your peers. I've had some great male teachers that I've taught with a few times, and that's great. And, and, and the teammates I have at the schools I've been at, they've been great. And, and, and I have to watch and, and see some of the things they do well. and, and and try to incorporate those into you know how I treat kids and how I work with kids because we learn from each other. So. And I love that you said we learn so much from observing. I wish, I wish that twice a year, three times a year, we could go and just watch other teachers teach mm -hmm. because we learn so much from watching great teachers get into that moment of when you know that they're just where they're meant to be. And mm -hmm. being able to watch that, you just absorb their passion, their greatness, and, and take it with you. And so when I started teaching, you know, I thought I had to know it all. And 
how I taught is sort of making it up as I go my own way. I guess there's a lot of benefit to that. You're not tied down to structures, but I sort of have my own spin on things and the way I do things. But what I did learn to do after a while is pay attention to my peers and see what they're doing in their classes and how they do things and incorporate that in mind. So I owe a, a debt to watching other great teachers that I worked with and I have worked with great teachers. So, <laughs> and be my own self, but find the best things that other, are other people do too. Jim, you're creeping up on 40 years of being a teacher. Huh, yeah. Man, that's awesome. I, I'm really in awe of that. And I'm just curious, there has to, there, there had to have been a time or two where like that, that passion that you're showing us through the screen right now, like waned a little bit. And then uh -huh. how, did you, how did you come out of that slump? Um, yeah, uh, first of all, the 40 years really creeps up to me because I love sometimes the kids don't have as idea or time. So sometimes, you know, a couple years ago, oh, I think he's 32. No, he's 38. <laughs> It's like, yeah, you're my best student ever, <laughs> you know. <Yeah. laughs> so they don't have a concept of that time, who's old or whatever. But now, yeah, I don't think I've ever felt where I've lost inspiration. Um, I know every day I have to check myself and say, how can I do that better? <laughs> um, but I have had, uh, and part of that is I'm an endurance athlete. Um, I was a, a runner in high school and college. I was a triathlete doing Ironman competitions after my first year of teaching. It was just a brand new thing. No one knew what it was. I was probably one of the first 3,000 people to ever do an Ironman distance race somewhere around the world. Had no idea what I was getting into. Never biked or swam that far in my life when I did it. But I like the challenge of things like that. When so, things get painful, when things get um, a little tough, I sort of like dig in mm -hmm. a bit. So, um, Teaching is not, has often many times been very painful. Um, as a marathon runner, we, I live about, I'm in New Hampshire, but we're on the mass line. So we're like 45 minutes from Boston. So I've done the Boston marathon multiple times, wow. you know, and um, I was doing all sorts of lessons with my class, even if I wasn't there, because I'm running the race. It's on a Monday. It's a holiday in Massachusetts, Patriot's Day, but not in New Hampshire. So we teach school. They have the day off. And so you could always take a personal day mm -hmm. and go down and run the Boston Marathon. I'd leave lesson plans. And I had subs tell me that was the best day I ever taught in my life that day where you went and ran the Boston Marathon. And we were doing all these things about the race together until what the superintendent changed everything one year. You may not take a personal day for leisure or free time activity because he was targeting the Boston Marathon. Mm. And there were talks back and forth that made the newspapers and all sorts of stuff. Teacher can't run the Boston Marathon. And we were waiting for a talk a few days before the race, but I had a, I was just getting so tired of it. And I, I knew I couldn't disobey if they took it away from me. So um, I sort of knew the race director from doing the triathlons. He was the race director of the triathlons I did. So Dave McGilvery, I, I knew he had a streak around the Boston Marathon. So he became the race director. He um, kept a streak up by writing, running after the whole race was over. He'd run at midnight or whatever. So I said, Dave, here's my predicament. Would you like someone to run with you <laughs> at night? <laughs> oh, geez. And he said, no problem, coming down. And he has people run with him. Mm -hmm. And so fortunately it wasn't at midnight. So I taught my full day of school. Uh, I already had all the New, New Hampshire news stations and beforehand or even came in during the day to record my class as a teacher who couldn't run the Boston Marathon. And as soon as school got out, um, we, we um, two cars full of teachers and parents from my school all got together. They got me in a car and they dragged me down, drove me down to Hopkinton where the start line is. There's Dave. It's like four o'clock in the afternoon and he's there with a couple friends and off we go running towards Boston. Nice. And they all waited there at the finish line. And you know, by the end of that night, every single station in Boston had an interview on the 11 o'clock news that a teacher that couldn't run Boston. I had people that came down from, from New Hampshire that I didn't know. They'd drive along, are you that teacher? I just wanted you to know. And, you know, I made something good out of it. It was, I would have rather have been a quiet little guy that no one noticed that just enjoyed a fun day at the race. But um, you have to sometimes do what you're supposed to do and, and find another way. So I found another way and um, 
but in my head, I'm going, how can they not get it? Right. The lessons I was teaching at an inner city school or what are inner city kids that needed that type of role model, that, that activity. And even a couple of years before, one of the boys had written a note to the newspaper saying, you know, Mr. Hansen ran the Boston Marathon today. He didn't win, but he told us, showed us to never give up. And it was in the newspaper. And two years later, they're saying, you can't run it. So mm -hmm. um, it, it didn't lose my inspiration, but it's sort of, oh, what are you thinking? Now, were you able to walk the next day, like Tuesday when you went back to teach again? Were you able to walk around? Yes, yes. Like I recovered pretty well. I recovered pretty well. And that was a slower marathon because Dave just did, I mean, I taught a full day. He just put on the whole Boston Marathon. <laughs> and, and we started at four, and, and I couldn't believe the course was cleaned up. Oh, wow. Everything was gone. The water bottles, I mean, it was all cleaned up because he's such an organizer. And a few years later, even um, the Wall Street Journal had found out about the story. They were doing an article on Boston Marathon. They had the heaviest guy to run it. They had the oldest guy to run it, and then they had a teacher that had to run it late at night. So I made the Wall Street Journal, which is great as a form of economics major. Right. <laughs> I made the Wall Street <laughs> Journal, but it was sort of like the funny page. And, and that, that's unfortunate because I think sometimes society forgets that we're people and we've got, we've got things that we do outside of teaching that mm -hmm. help us stay inspired. I think that there's a big movement around keeping teachers mentally healthy. Mm -hmm. I heard that today at our teachers meeting. I said, thank you. You know, the new assistant superintendent said, take time for yourself. Take the, you know, the weekends off. Don't check your mail. <laughs> you know, we have to do that. But there was a time where it wasn't. 2000 was a different time. Mm -hmm. They were trying, teachers had to do everything. It was, I think, mean, just near the beginning of No Child Left Behind. You had to do everything and be everywhere and, and be everything to the kids. And you can't to the exclusion of who you are as a person. If you lose yourself as a person, that's when you're done teaching. And I love how you took, at least as I'm listening to you tell it, this, this situation that I, oh my goodness, they're, they're not going to let him run it. And you made it into something awesome. Yes. Like that, that's totally inspiring. And, and I was reading a little bit about some of your trips to Kenya. So could you, could you take some time to, to tell us a little bit about that? Because I think that that's really inspiring as well. The pastor in my church said, we're going on a mission trip to Kenya. We want teachers to go to the slum. Do you ever thought of anything like that? And I said, I don't have any money. But my kids have gone. My, my son had gone to high school trips to clean up after Hurricane Katrina. He's been to Haiti. And I go, that's sort of cool. He does all that stuff. And, you know, I wish I could do something like that. I was like, you're going to work on that. We're going to get you there. So uh, I did some fundraising. And I thought it'd be a once-in-a-lifetime trip because he's there yeah, you're a teacher I know you, you you do that well and you love the Kenyan marathoners and so he's thought there was connections there and so uh, the trip is to one of the largest slums in Africa it's the, called the Mathari Valley slum in Nairobi Kenya it's the second largest slum there and it's um, poverty at an unreal level um, most families earn about a dollar a day they live in tin shacks next to each other, next to each other, you know, this much apart from across the alleyway to other tin shacks just stacked together. Maybe I don't know an accurate count, maybe in a three, three and a half mile square area, uh, half a million people, maybe more. I've heard different estimates. You know, I've heard up to a million, but it's probably more towards half a million. They don't have an accurate count. And people live in like 10 by 10 foot tin shacks. Just they are sometimes families of a couple, sometimes up to 10 kids or other people's kids if, the fam if parents have died from AIDS or different things that they might contract. And um, because it's a slum, those things are hidden away even from the Kenyans. And um, they, there's no public school, there's no, there's no running water, sanitation, the open sewers going down the road. And I was told, this is gonna, this is gonna be, this trip's gonna freak you out. And, um, we show up, and the second I got into school, those kids were no different than my kids in Nashua in America. They were the same. Lively, funny, creative, intelligent. And they love education, because they know that's their ticket out for them and their families. They just love school. They just want to learn. I, I was like, that was the best time in my life. I loved it there, and I came home, and I go, 
America, where's the community? You walk down the street and you don't see anyone unless they're out mowing the lawn. They may not even turn and look at you. And there was not that, that same, and it just busted me up. I was just like, I can never go back there again. It was, it was, it was you know, just too much culture shock. But it was more culture shock coming back to America. You go into stores, you see all the abundance we have. And you remember how little they had there. So after a while, there's another trip and somehow money comes together. <laughs> if it's meant to happen, it happens. And then there's a second trip. And by that time, I knew what I wanted to do, which is to, to teach poetry there. Because you only have a short time with the kids. You, you, you're not a miracle whatever <laughs> worker or whatever, anything. But I felt more like an artist in residence, so I can't write poems. But I could take poems my kids in my school wrote and reports they wrote and about me and telling about themselves and bring it to Kenya and use that as models along with some mentor master poems. And I wasn't shy. I started off with um, the poem I've been using for 30 years, The Tiger by William Blake, one of the greatest poems in English language. And you know, what are you doing teaching these kids in Kenya that tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest, but, but they would write a poem, not worry about rhyming, you write a poem. If you could talk to an animal, what would you say to that animal? Like the person in the tiger is asking the tiger, you know, how did you come to be? You know, why, why are you like this? Where did you get, you know, where did you get your brain? What, what furnace was your brain made? And I was finding these poems um, like that or William Carlos Williams poems on the red wheelbarrow. That was a simple one to do. And, and um, interested my kids at home use them as models for the kids in Kenya, where they would write, <laughs> you would love this as a teacher. I never heard, I probably taught 1,500, 2,000 kids, I never heard, is this good enough? Is this long enough? How long does it have to be? Do I have to do this? Never. Whether, and I taught from third grade, even up to 12th grade, different classes. That, and they never, most of them, usually one kid out of, you know, 30 in a class that had never written a poem. They studied them, and, but they just latched onto it and they wrote some marvelous things that I would then take back. And I was trying to find poems that would tell about what's important to kids on both continents. Yeah. So Shang Ya is an ancient Chinese poem about um, friendship, a friendship both. Or an old English poem, I Am From Ireland, where you invite someone into your, the Irish dancer, you invite someone into your country, your city, your town, ask them to do something you love to do with them. Very simple poem for kids to work from. And then I found the last time, I, I've been five times, my last trip I found new books, I don't know, like Say Something, Peter Reynolds, about changing the world. You know, you can do it with your voice, you can do it with art, you can do it, but just say something. There are many ways to say what you want, because I think these kids will be changed the world someday. Or there's an invocation before morning. It's really this kid making an invocation that um, they want a snow day. <laughs> <laughs> so they can be with a family and not go to school. So you bring this to Kenya and I brought those cotton snowballs mm. <laughs> and, and let them have a snowball fight. <laughs> you know, they thought it was real snowballs at first. No, 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 it's not cold. Let's just throw them at each other and have some fun. And, and then they would write poems about things they wanted to change. Uh, the polluted water in the slum, um, things they learned in school, deforestation in their country and its effect on animals, they learn a lot there from their teachers. And so I just get inspired by some poem I see and how can I easily just rework that so that they can easily write a poem. And sometimes I'm with a class for an hour, I introduce myself in Kenya, talk about things, answer questions, read a poem, discuss, talk about it, show them how they can work on it. And by the end of the time, every kid in the class has written at least one poem. <laughs> It's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and some of them are just marvelous. I have a lot of fun going there and sharing on different levels. Sometimes I just teach three fifth grade classes at a school for a whole week. The last time I went to two different schools, I think in two weeks, I taught like 850, I lost count, 850 kids. That was my estimate going from class to class. And I get to tell those stories back to my kids in New Hampshire. And they get to see the poems and see, see the kids and realize they're just like them. I want them to see these kids would be your good friends. You'd love to play with them. You'd love to sit and play games with them. They're no different than you. It's just, you know, their circumstances of where they were born, but they're still creative and they're, they're, they're still talented. And the amount, the, the stuff I see, I know with that education, 
some of those kids, I tell them, you're going to be world changers. You're going to change your family, change your neighborhood, your community, whether they stay in the slum their whole life or change their city or change their country or maybe even change the world. You're, you're not only taking poems over to Kenya, but you're bringing the Kenyan poems back mm -hmm. to your students and yeah. you're sharing that experience and you're broadening everybody's world view. I think that is so necessary and powerful. Mm -hmm. Kudos to you for really, really championing that. I think that's fantastic. Well, and, and as you were talking, you were talking about how we need to, we need to bridge these gaps and, and see that we're all, we're all alike. And that's what you're doing with, with your classroom and this classroom. You're, you're breaking down the walls of a school mm -hmm. and you're creating students of the world. <laughs> yes. And, and what, what, what I really had a lot of fun with, I tell my kids in Nashville, I said, you know, usually when you write something, I have to read it. Sometimes we put it up on the bulletin board or you read it to class. Hopefully your parents will read it. But you know what? You're writing this stuff and it's going to a completely different continent. And I wish I could show you the pictures. When I, we laminate photos of the kids and about me and the poem they wrote and drawings they do. And I have these for different poems and I bring them over there and I just I do a poem and I hand out all these pictures from the kids in my class. And the kids in Kenya, just their eyes, they devour. They're reading the poems, they're reading about, they're just infatuated because they want to learn more about America and American students and that connection. And then I'm sitting there with, with you know, teaching a poem in Kenya. And then I, I go back and I, I take photos of all of them. I probably have a couple thousand photos of poems because they, because I want them to keep it. I don't want to take their poems. I, I want to see what they wrote and sometimes run up to me and they read it and there's some amazing things that happen and you know the next day you go back you know you know that poem you wrote i put it on facebook and you know there's all these comments from my friends in america and my friends in, and i list different contents someone in australia commented someone in south america someone in england and i said your poem has been read by people throughout the world that you wrote yesterday in class. And the eyes are like, you know, and I go like, yeah. And, and I don't know, my guess is that gives them so much joy inside and so much going from a little person in this poor place to wow. And some of the poems that have come out are, have been just amazing because sometimes kids take it. Do I have time to read a couple? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I looked at one poem, poem that a boy had written called AIDS, AIDS, AIDS. And I go, oh. And I read this thing. I said to the, the, um, uh, the social worker that was, I mean, one of the people, girls I meet at lunch with, I said, do you think he wrote this? She says, yeah, that's, that's the experience of many kids because HIV is prevalent. And so this kid, in his own time, wrote this thing that he didn't think anyone would see. And I saw it, took a photo, I get on the plane and I, I put it online, I go, what do you think people, did he, is this like a, a famous poem he copied or what's going on here? He's a little fifth grade boy. And this is what he wrote, AIDS, 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 it's by Sydney. AIDS, 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 what a killer disease you are. Since my birth, I knew about you. And as a young, innocent child, I welcomed you into my life. We played and enjoyed everything with you. AIDS, 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 what a killer disease you are. People in our country are from heroes. Now we are heading to zeros. AIDS, 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 what a killer disease you are. Children have been left orphans. Mothers have been left widows. Fathers have been left widowers. You have discouraged people not to achieve their dreams. AIDS, 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 what a killer disease you are. I'm like, are you kidding me? Wow. <laughs> but, but he unveiled himself he didn't know he was showing it to me but that's what was on his mind that's you know listening you know you, you get to know a kid even if it's from a piece of paper they wrote and it's like oh my goodness and, and yeah you know without telling me too much that's the experience of many of these kids they were born with hiv and they live with it their entire lives and i go i'm this thing I should be published, you know. I, I, he didn't edit it or anything. I don't know, maybe it took him five minutes. And another year, I was teaching the same poem. And, you know, the day had gone on to a class and fifth graders, and, and they all had gone out to play and take a break. And one girl's sitting there, 
writing and staring up the wall. So she showed me her poem. And again, she went away from the animals and she wrote cancer. Cancer, cancer, you bite like a snake. You take away many people's beauty and you take away their beautiful hair. Why do you harm many people the way you want? Many people are lied in their grave because of your disease. Parents, teachers, farmers, doctors, and my fellow pupils, please, I beg you, let's fight to cure cancer. I have now left all the responsibility to you to know if you can fight cancer or if you can't. Cancer, cancer, you bite like a snake. You take away many people's beauty and you take away their beautiful hair. And of course I have to go, Sadie, how are you? <laughs> Right. This isn't about you, is it? Because a lot of girls shave their heads. It's really close. Kind of, oh, no, this poor little girl who's so vibrant. She's, no, she goes, no, my aunt has cancer. Oh. And so we talked about that. And, and, and again, in just a few short connections, you know, the next year I go back, I had all the poems in, in, in a, you know, typed out. So whatever poem, I just go into a class, like, what poem should I do today? <laughs> you know, what one do I want to teach you? And I have a booklet of all the poems that whatever. And, and the cover of the booklet, I put a cover picture of her. Because <laughs> I wanted to know, this was one of, this was your friend. And, and she's an author, and she's a poet. And the stuff that my kids in Nashua sometimes come up with, and you learn from them, the boy that wrote about his his dad being away in Afghanistan and just wanting for him to come home and can't understanding that or other issues that they have or just, just you know, the great poems that they write. And, and so, you know, there's nothing in our curriculum that says kids write poems. Right. But sometimes you close your door and do your own thing. You find your own way. <laughs> it's clear you're an inspiration. Like to be an inspiration on a couple different continents is really that is really amazing. And to touch the lives of the children you do on both continents is fantastic. I, mm. Kudos to you. Like this, is, this has been such fun to hear of how you inspire kids and how you build relationships on both continents and, and bring it back and forth. It's awesome. And, and talking about that as a last thing, um, we did, a, um, well, it was the before morning <laughs> invocation. And the kids are writing all these serious poems about problems in the slum and problems in their country and what you'd really expect and want to see. And this was with a fourth grade class, Tom. So, you know, here's a fourth grader. Yeah. And one of the, my next step, the students that were helping out said, oh, Jim, read this poem right here, this kid wrote. And it had nothing to do with, he, he wrote this poem um, based on before wings instead of before morning. On the, it was, it was just fantastic fantasy type thing. On the people's back, let there be wings. As people go to work, let them fly. Let all people fly. Let children play in the sky. Let people work fast while having wings. Let people go to other planets easily. <laughs> Please, just this once, change people to be hardworking. Make all people like heroes. I go, oh, that's sort of cool. That's so different. I sort of like, I said, I got to draw, I can't draw. <laughs> I draw a picture of that. And, and I went back to school that year and I, I found I had this fifth grade boy who was an incredible artist. Yeah. And I said, I got a job for you, Ori. <laughs> Can you illustrate this poem for me? And I found a picture in a book of someone with wings. And I don't know if you can you can you see some of his drawings? Yeah. Oh, that's kids awesome. Kids and people with wings. And then, then we did an Animoto video. We took little snapshots of different parts of this and put the put different lines from the poem. And all of a sudden, a boy in Kenya and a boy in New Hampshire have collaborated on this visual poetry video of things together. And that's that unity, that understanding of each other. And, you know, that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> so, Jim, this, this has been absolutely amazing. I love listening to you. I'm sitting here like you can't tell, but I'm sitting at the edge of my seat wanting, <laughs> wanting more. Um, we always ask one question at the end. In your opinion, what does the world need today? And that's so hard. It, it's uh, the world today. <laughs> this is just, you know, I'm old. I've never seen anything like this. And, and in thinking about that, um, I went, the word I want to go with is, is unity. We need, you know, I'm thinking of this, the two boys in a poem. To get there, okay, I have more than one word, you have to listen to each other. No longer are people listening. Everyone's shouting. And 
at least the adults are. <laughs> and it's the listening part. And, and that's part of, you know, going to another country and sharing back and forth, hearing and learning about people are the same wherever we are and we're so divided right now. And if we don't get unity, I'm not sure where we're going. And from that listening is where we develop that empathy that is often missing right now in our barrage of yelling at each other and only thinking one way. We need to have that empathy through listening so that we can become united as people, as, as a country throughout the world that we can, I don't know how I can do that. I don't know how you can get the world to do that. I can only do it in my little world. Mm. So even if it's just a classroom in New Hampshire and some kids in Africa, and I can tell the stories back and forth. And you'd love being in my room because if the kids are really bored and they want to do something, all you have to do is ask me about Kenya and off I go. <laughs> so they, some of the kids have learned that. You know, oh, he's going to show some pictures and he's going to tell stories and introduce his <laughs> kids and we won't have to do math for right now. <laughs> so it's, it's a great strategy that some, some classes have learned very well because I love talking about the experiences because my eyes were opened. I, I, I wasn't aware of the differences and yet the similarities. And I think it's the similarities that, and that we, you know, what the world needs right now is unity. And I hope we can find it really soon. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. I hope so yeah. too. You do your part in Africa and, and uh, New Hampshire, and I'll do my part here in mm -hmm. Omaha and Josh will do his part. And maybe if everybody does their little, little corner of the world, We'll, uh, we'll be in a better place. Well, thank you so much, Jim. This, is, this has been a blast. I, I enjoyed my time. Thank you for inviting me. And it's, it has been fun. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our show. Thanks for tuning in this week. We're so thankful and appreciative that you took your time to listen to our guest, Jim Hansen. Hopefully you're ready for another week of changing lives. And hopefully what the world needs now is helping you to sustain your inspiration as you enter a new year. If it is, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. This helps us to continue to get inspirational educator stories out. We hope that as you head out, you remember that the biggest factor that plays into student success is you. Your love, your passion, your empathy, your dedication is exactly what the world needs now. Thank you for everything you do. Have a good one.